I speak for democracy? Democracy speaks for itself. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. <laughs> so uh, I, that's where I started off. I didn't speak for democracy. Uh, the Statue of Liberty spoke for democracy. The preamble to the Constitution speaks for democracy. The Lincoln Gettysburg Address speaks for democracy. And on and on down, I went to showing how different things spoke for democracy, not me. <laughs> They spoke for democracy. Democracy was speaking for itself by what it did and, and what it caused other people to want to do. I never considered myself a spokesperson for Newtown, but I, I consider myself a person who knows enough about Newtown to let people know what the people in Newtown desire and what they want to do and what they will uh, support and what they want support. Uh, I I can do that, but I try not to speak for Newtown. I think. Uh, Growing up here before the Civil Rights Act, the things that we were allowed or not allowed to do was a motivation. I think it was a motivation. Ms. Janie Jackson Poe was my math teacher, and she would always tell us, she said, you know, it's not good enough to, to uh, do your best. You gotta do better than your best. She said, if you wanna win a race, she said, you got to run as fast as the other person in order to keep up. She said, but if you are behind, you got to run twice as fast as the other person in order to catch up. And she said, once you catch up, you got to run as fast again in order to get ahead. And so that's what she did. When we went to school, when we came here, we would have one math textbook in a class. But she didn't allow that to, to stop her. She would let us come to her home, and she would teach us algebra. She would teach us geometry. She would teach us trigonometry. She taught us those things so that uh, when we uh, went on up in school, we were able to handle it. And when we got out of school and went away to college, even though we came from a small school, we were still able to excel. When I was growing up, it was not just my family that raised me, it was the whole village, it was the whole town that helped to raise me, and they helped in many different ways. And so I just, I just felt obligated to do whatever I could do. We need to have that family kind of relationship with people in our community and not be uh, strangers or aliens to people who live a uh, door or two or three doors or five doors or, or down at the other end of the street. I think we need to be available to them when they need help. I think that would be one of the greatest things we can do. When I ran for the public office, I ran on this making neighborhoods neighborly. And I won. <laughs> When we came in 1939, this was very much a fishing area. Sarasota County is only a oh, hundred and some years old, and uh, I've been here 73 of those hundred and some years. 
So it was more of a fishing area, and many people would go on Ringling Bridge and fish. Some of them would sell it, and others would eat it. <laughs> so we just enjoyed going there, even before Bird's Key had been constructed. We would go there and uh, just have a good time. Just We waded out in the water. We had to keep our eyes open, though, uh, to make sure that those uh, stingrays didn't get to us. <laughs> that was one of the joys of our lives because fishing at the old Ringling Bridge uh, uh, was not only a hobby. It was not only a hobby, but it was a means of making a living. <laughs> her. She was 19, and I was 28, so I'm nine years older than she is. And she swore to, to her uh, godmother that, that she would not marry me because she said, marry that old man, not me. And she married that old man, and we are in our 52nd year. <laughs> All I did was ask for her company. I would take her riding. We would ride, and I would sing cowboy songs to her. I enjoyed singing cowboy songs to her. I had bought uh, 1953 Chevrolet, and I, I was driving that, and it had a good heater in it, especially during the wintertime. You put that heat on, it was warm and I'd just drive along and we'd talk and, and whatnot and we were together for quite a while, uh, about a year or so I guess. And then I asked her about marrying, she said, no, I want to marry. I said, okay. So I just kept picking up, taking her to movies, taking her to places to eat just enjoying each other and just having a good time together. My wedding was a simple one, and yet it was a crowded one. People were standing up around the walls doing the wedding ceremony. But it was good. It was very good. I was sweating, though. I don't know why I was sweating so much. My best man had a handkerchief in his hand, and he kept dapping my face. <laughs> Yeah, I was nervous. <laughs> We've had a good life together. We enjoy one another. I still take on rides. <laughs> For a while, I was taking her down to Marina Jackson. We would park out there in the evening, and we would just kind of talk and watch the boats going out and coming in and whatnot, and, uh, and feeling that breeze. You have to, your car window down and that breeze just blowing through there. It was marvelous. Oh. 